Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think I, I don't know if I've been to every single one of these sessions. I've been to most of them over the last nine years. Um, I think I was at that second session that was here. Um, this is my third time speaking. So huge thanks to Robert and the whole Thornton Tomasetti Core Studio crew for having me here. Um, I will warn you in advance that like um, this being my third presentation has the least number of actual architectural projects in it. Um, so it's gonna be a different kind of presentation. And similar to the last one that I gave, um, I would argue it's very much in beta. So I'm kind of curious what everybody thinks of this. So I'm, I'm definitely interested in the conversation that comes afterwards. So in 1962, Douglas Engelbart, uh, founder of what many consider to be the kind of core concepts of human and computer interaction, wrote an essay called Augmenting the Human Intellect, a Conceptual Framework. And it started off with a really interesting passage that goes very much to our industry um, about the augmented architect at work. In it, he describes many of the features that we've come to know in CAD and BIM. And these passages in particular stand out. Next, he begins the functional analysis. Apologies in advance for the gender specificity in this. This is 1962. Um, he has a list of activities who will occupy this building. Uh, of, sorry, a, a list of people who are occupied this building and the daily sequences of their activities. The clerk allows him to follow in each turn, examining how doors swing, where special lighting might be needed. Finally, he has the clerk combine all of these sequences of activities to indicate spots where traffic is heavy in the building or where congestion might occur and determine where the severest drain on the utilities might be. Goes on further to say, the computer has many other capabilities for manipulating and displaying information that can be of significant benefit to the human in non-mathematical processes of planning, organizing, studying, etc. 1962. The idea was that through working with the computer as a partner, Engelbart believed that the architect would generate a hyperlinked structure that represents the maturing of thought behind the actual design. Now, I'm kind of curious how many of you think your building and information models contain within it a maturing of thought behind the design versus just being an artifact of that process. But ultimately, Engelbart's goal with this work was centered on increasing the capability of man to approach a complex situation, to gain comprehension to suit his particular needs, and to derive solutions to problems. Now, with that passage from 60 years ago in mind, let's bring forward to today. Now, I'm gonna assume most of you have either read this book, heard Phil Bernstein talk about it for years, or even read Daniel Davis's recent review. Uh, the framework of the book, though, can be summarized with this quote. If knowledge is indeed at the heart of the professions, two questions follow. The first is this, how effective are the professions at producing, capturing, nurturing, and reusing their knowledge within their own organizations? And the second question, might there be a different and better ways to produce knowledge and making it available in society? Methods that might not directly involve the traditional professions at all. Now imagine many of you at this conference would agree that profession of architecture often fails at the former, especially with the capturing, nurturing, and reusing knowledge, and even more so when we extend those ideas beyond our single firms to the wider industry. And for the latter, we're seeing the advent of a new market of AEC companies working to explore this opportunity. Now, while in no way do I object to that new market, absolutely not, but I feel that the obituary for the architecture firm need not be prematurely written. And this talk will bring up some ways to address that. Our profession needs to get behind a collective technology enabled vision for our industry to treat the synthesis of technology in our services as a strategic asset rather than a necessary evil, or we will continue to face one existential crisis after another. To quote the book, Machine Platform Crowd, the successful companies of the second machine age will be those that bring together minds and machines, products and platforms, and the core and the crowd very differently than most do today. Now, before we explore today's world, I'd like to consider a historical framework for some of these technolo technological transitions. Again, in the book, The Future of the Professions, the authors spend time outlining the previous set of technology-driven changes to culture and the new ways that knowledge is conveyed as a result of those change. They take us through example transitions like the movement from oral traditions to script, 
from script to print, and ultimately from print to today's transition into information technologies. They're clear to point out where these early stages of each of these transitions actually mimic the previous traditions, but in a new form. So an example is uh, when we get got into a written script, it was as a way to write down stories from the oral tradition. The earliest print publications were books stylized to mimic handwritten script. And even the internet's earliest days were full of web pages containing similar content and navigation of a printed book. Now in AEC, you could ask the question, what are the early stages of work that we do that mimic the past technologies? You could argue anything that's in the realm of formal deliverables or digital drawings. They're just simply generated differently than before. They also point out in this book, this idea of accessibility, uh, sorry, accessibility accelerators, technologies that push the adoption of these new ways of thinking um, pat, um, uh, at the inception of each of the new phases. For example, the movement from script to print was furthered by the Gutenberg printing press. I do also ask the question, what are the most impactful accessibility accelerators within the AEC market? CAD or BIM? Maybe not. Web technologies enabling the AEC market, data schemas, yet to be determined. Lastly, the early adopters of this new tradition of each of these transitions in technologies were the specialists, the experts, determining the language and methods of knowledge sharing and the structure of the professions in this new era. To quote, in the age of orality, mastery of what we now regard as individual areas of expertise would be given only to a few the senior elders of the community of almost mystical status who attain these positions precisely because of their ability to draw easily upon their recollections of past experiences and from insights passed along from previous generations, insights that they too would have handed to their successors. In each of these technological transitions, every time we move through one, it increased the importance of that new generation to teach everyone in the past generations this new method of communicating. So who are these new early adopters? Who are these specialists, experts of new methods of knowledge sharing, creating this new symbolic language? I would argue it's those with skills in design computation. People in this room, the people watching this talk from their computer. A month or so ago, Ian Keogh referred to this group as the priesthood when retweeting a post by Mel Conway that argued about the importance of a more democratized understanding of software. The point being that the exclusive priesthood of, of knowledge is not what we want. Our goal should be to restructure the profession and educate everyone through this technology, technology and knowledge transition to absorb this into the wider culture. Daniel Davis in his review of the future of the professions notes, the Suskinds say that the successful professionals of tomorrow will need to embrace new methods of communicating. At the moment, many in the architecture industry are simply not prepared, partly because these channels have risen, risen so quickly and partly because the old channels have become so instinctive after years of mastery. This provides opportunities for the next generation, the generation that is likely as adept at communicating these new mediums as the older generations was at communicating through drawings, books, and presentations. Now I'm gonna take you through a collection of ideas that I feel provide a framework potentially for a way forward. If we look at the early days of computing, it was expected that a computer user was also a computer programmer. This is how you were able to get the computer to do what you wanted. Computers were there to aid creation, to help you author new ideas. In an online post, Andy Machusek and Michael Nelson referred to the famous computer scientist, Alan Kay, who argued that instead of tools for thought, as Howard Rheingold would have put it, medium for thought is a more powerful goal for computing, saying, such a medium creates a powerful and immersive context, a context in which the user can have new kinds of thoughts, thoughts that were formerly impossible to them. The medium expands the range of human thought. Now, in my own path of collecting and making connections between various packets of knowledge, I've encountered a number of concepts um, like the second brain in regards to note-taking and writing applications. Tools like Rome, which I actually use to generate the content for this talk, present themselves as a note-taking tool for network thought, providing a new kind of environment for knowledge exploration built on top of graph da databases. The idea, the ability to record ideas 
explore new ones, and later draw connections between these ideas is like nothing I've actually ever experienced before. The computer is my peer in this environment, in that I can let the second brain work the way the computer does best, letting my human brain do what it does best. This leads me to ask, um, and, uh, ask the question, what are the opportunities for concepts like mediums for thought or second brains in the discipline of design? Building on the work of Engelbart, they may provide a fundamental conceptual framework translated for industry for a truly augmented architect. The key to creating this medium of thought is to prioritize spaces over solutions. So what do I mean by that? I mean that we need to prioritize the creation of space in which we explore the problem, one informed by data and experience, rather than focusing the technology on automating the creation of novelty. I'll come back to that. My view is that your role as computational designers, software developers, and more is not to make something that directly finds the solution, but instead creates a space in which solutions are explored. The goal is to create an informed design space for exploration and understanding of problems. Within augmentation, we can see some possibilities for what Marvin Minsky, one of the founders of, uh, a, of Fathers of AI called the Society of the Mind, an idea that the interactions between smaller AI agents together with humans can create an overall collective system that is more intelligent than the individual parts. Now it can be easier to imagine an entirely AI-based design future because we can just continue our anthropocentric view of intelligence in both its positive and negative connotations. However, it is a lot harder for us to imagine the arguably even more real and immediate opportunities through a computer augmented collective intelligence. We have fewer mental models for the hyperconnectivity between people and machines that should and will be our future in design and architecture. Channeling the late psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the tools you create and the design spaces you foster should enable, not interrupt, the flow states of creative production. They should balance both challenge and skill. My concern is that too many of the tools in our uh, being explored in the industry will lead to boredom and apathy. The black box solutions, like some forms of both generative and AI-based design, will result in a cognitive de-skilling of our profession. The goal of a design interface should be to drive challenging and engaging exploration, not provide solutions that actually reduce understanding. And throughout all this, we need to remind ourselves that design is full of tacit knowledge. And therefore in design, we run into difficulties of knowledge acquisition into systems, summarized perfectly by Michael Polanyi's observation, we know more than we can tell. The knowledge of experts is often in unstructured and informal formats based on experience this will continue to remain a challenge for our industry. So specifically, where do we go now? I would argue it starts with data fluency. Again, Daniel Davis in his review of the future professions notes, being fluent with data is quickly shifting from an opportunity to a necessity. The best firms will be the ones that can organize, analyze and extract value from this new resource, which for most firms is a new competency. This is how we make better designers through augmentation, provide them with better data at the right moment in order to improve the feedback loop, the learning feedback loop. So sure, take your gut feeling as an important data point, no concern about that, but take it with a conscious understanding of your mental biases and your use of uh, use other data and integrated technologies to provide a rapid feedback for learning. We then must consider the broader software landscape. Our industry is in midst of some healthy tension between entrenched players, new startups, and an industry of architects that have historically been way too passive in their engagement of technology and design. As software developer Gordon Brander put it, creative work means piecing together unique workflows using many different tools. The degree to which a workflow has been embodied in a single tool is the degree to which that creative act has been commoditized. This does lead me to ask the question, if project delivery in Revit is a commodity, where are our opportunities for designing the future of the built environment? Brander goes on to say, if a tool supports composition with other tools, it supports open-ended evolution. 
An evolutionary system will always be more expressive than one that isn't. In the past, the AEC industry had to sometimes take an almost adversarial interoperability approach to connect our tools. That being an approach to interoperability not explicitly endorsed by platform providers, but was necessary to deliver on project workflows. Now we have a multitude of open source software, protocols and schemas, APIs connecting tools to generate old new workflows, and even the potential beginnings of a marketplace for architectural functions. Now, granted, the large software vendors are also getting into the game, yet I remain bullish on the idea that the central hubs, the protocols and schemas framing how we communicate and collaborate to remain open and non-proprietary in order to provide for all potential futures of the professions, not just the ones provided by the software vendors. As architects, we can no longer afford, both literally and figuratively, to be passive in determining how technology will influence our profession. We need to be actively engaged in how it can positively affect the entire industry, from bespoke buildings showcased in design to the much larger market of buildings that make up the rest of the built environment. And here we can take a cue from Casey Reese, digital artist and co-creator of Processing, when he says, I need to have precise control of my tools to form my ideas, and I need to be able to modify my tools to explore new ideas. I want to believe that I can form unique ideas in contrast to accepting the ideas that are encoded in the software tools that I'm using. All that being said, it still comes back to people. How do you realize all of this in practice? It comes through culture. I believe we should not be celebrating computational heroics. These are symptoms of some of the negative cultural aspects of the architecture profession that needs to end. Instead, we should be su support and celebrate those that are able to infuse new thinking into the firm's culture, driving widespread impact. To come back again to Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, specifically in his book, Creativity. Creativity does not happen inside people's heads, but in the interaction between a person's thoughts and the sociocultural context. It's a systemic rather than individual phenomenon. Ultimately, we need to create a hyper-connected culture of community of people around innovation. Taken a cue from the Culture Code by Daniel Coyle, cultural change in a healthy community comes from three foundations. You build safety, a space where all, all, all ideas can be shared and discussed by everyone. You share vulnerability, an understanding that an expectation of perfection is the enemy of good culture. And ultimately you establish purpose, a shared idea, a vector, a guiding cultural movement. We as leaders all have a part to play in establishing the culture. And it isn't about us being the only innovators or by us leading innovation groups. We are the catalyst for the broader community. Lastly, within our practices, we need to actively engage in redefining existing roles and career paths now infused with technology and foster entirely new career paths blazing new trails for our profession. When we augment our thinking by incorporating computational processes like socio-spatial analysis, it opens up the opportunity for us to be even more human in our approaches to design for the built environment. It allows us to focus more on empathy. Our brains develop in the context of our bodies, their physical presence and their experience of that presence in a physical space. And this empathy can extend further to understanding the socio-cultural dimensions of our work. We can understand better the, uh, the cultural history of a place, back to even understanding that we're currently standing on what was originally the land of the Lenape people. And lastly, this empathy can give us a space to understand to understanding the broader impact of broader global impact of our work through the pervasive infusion of environmental impact analysis at every step from concept to construction and into operations. If your work in computation, whether it's on a single project or in the development of software is not taking into account our negative impact on the climate then I have some serious concerns about your priorities. In the end, humans are amazing. Humans augmented with tools are even more amazing. Humans with instruments at their disposal, using a symbolic notation as a common language 
are incapable of incredible feats of, of collective creative flow. Thank you.